Hey, what's happening? Transformation Church, this is Pastor Derwin here. I have a very, very special announcement. Uh, you just, you know, I celebrated my 47th birthday, and I thought to myself, 47 years old, why not give the Carolina Panthers a call? So I called the Carolina Panthers. They took my call. I told them about the great shape that I was in, the bulging disc in my back, how overweight I am and how slow I am. And they were like, you are our guy. So guess what, people? I am going back to the NFL. I got a new position. I'm going to play center, guard, and tackle. Center of the bench, guard the water, and tackle anybody who tries to get it. Okay, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Hey, we are continuing our series, Ecclesia, and we have a really, really special guest. It's my good friend, Joel Mutamale. Joel uh, has a Master's of Divinity. He just started his PhD in theology. Uh, he and his beautiful family are part of Transformation Church. Uh, he partners with Pastor Tom uh, and Alex to be able to equip our TC group leaders so that our community and unity can grow. And he's gonna come out, and he is a fabulous communicator of the gospel and he is going to teach us. So would you give Joel Mudamale a round of applause and let's welcome him to the stage of Transformation Church. How y'all doing? Good, 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 good. All right, well, hey, this is particularly special for me because this service is like my service. My family and I, we always say we're going to get to the 10 o'clock service, and we roll just on time to this service. And so, in fact, that was my little guy right there, literally just walked right in. So we're, we're doing good. Hey, let me introduce you to my crew. Um, first, here you go, our three little boys, Liam, Levi, and Lucas. We've got three boys all under the age of six. Y'all can be praying for us. All right, all right. This is my beautiful wife, Brittany. Yes, I know, you're looking at me, you're looking at those boys, you're like, wait a minute, yes, they absolutely get their good looks from their mama. However, I always like to point out that they're wearing a Bollywood-themed outfit. Daddy got the ethnicity to the table, all right? So, when they're out in the sun, they got that golden tan brown skin. They can thank Dad for that, right? Um, I want to start, really, five years ago. And something unique happened back then. I was working for a Bible software company. I traveled uh, a lot, like 130,000 air miles. And so I ended up in Pennsylvania at a place called Creation Festival. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Creation Festival. Wow, yep, three people in the back. There we go, holding it down. Hey, uh, at Creation Festival, there are literally like 60,000 people there. Now, as I'm getting off the stage, I'm backstage, I meet this big black Goliath looking dude. His name was Pastor Derwin Gray. Now, five years ago, Pastor Derwin, we kind of connected and I was kind of talking to my wife and we're unpacking like, like man, we like really hit it off. And, and she looked at me and she goes, babe, that's called a bromance. I was like, I don't know about that, I'm not gonna claim that, but I guess if that's what it is, it's, it's what it is. But something unique happened. You see, we connected on a lot of things. Like, like for instance, both Pastor Durer and I are fiercely committed to the multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. Why? Because the scriptures are packed with examples and the intentionality of God to communicate this vision. Now, in all fairness, we also disagree fiercely on a couple things. For instance, Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. LeBron who? Okay. Now also, y'all might, uh, every now and then, PD, you know, he likes to talk about his Samsung Galaxy, the picture and the phone, the one person is excited about that. That's an example right there. Um, now, here's the deal. I was, last week, I was in Kansas City, and I was doing, I'm in my PhD program, we're doing some doctoral work, and I was in the original Hebrew. Guess what I found out? In the original Hebrew, the original Hebrew word for evil is Samsung Galaxy. <laughs> I'm just saying the text, the text points us now. I'm just playing why is it that among 60,000 people that Pastor Darren and I would connect? Like, what caused him to begin to actually speak into my life? So, for instance, when we just had Liam, um, I was traveling a lot. And so every now and then, PD would hit me up and be like, man, you're traveling a lot. Like, how's your wife doing with that? And how are your kids? And I was like, 
oh, I should probably have those conversations, right? And then the second baby comes along and the same thing, and he's like, man, you really love the local church, man. How's the church doing? Like, like, where are you connected and where are you plugged in? And I'm like, man, to be honest, I'm getting off of an airplane typically early Sunday morning just to try to race to church. And so here's the miraculous thing that happened. The love of God that Pastor Derwin experienced compelled him to share that love with an Indian dude that he met in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. You see, Pastor Derwin began to pastor me five years ago before Charlotte was even a thought on our brain. And so I love how God works. God provided both our pastor and our church family just like that five years ago. And here we are now. It's unbelievable. Now, here's what I want to suggest to you. That this love is not isolated to individual circumstances. It's not isolated just to the New Testament. It's throughout the entirety of the biblical narrative of the love of God. So you're saying, Joel, prove it. So I'll prove it. You can't get past Genesis 1 without seeing the love of God. Why? Well, we know the story, right? God creates the heavens and the earth and the animals and all the things, and it's, and it's beautiful. Notice what happens. Exclusively, God only gives his image and his likeness to who? Humanity. That is a supreme act of love. Catch that? Now, we get a couple pages later, and, and we get to Genesis 3. This is the depravity. This is the fall. Everything goes wrong. Now, Typically, this passage is taught like, all right, Adam and Eve, they eat of a fruit, and as they eat of a fruit, like, they sin, and as a result of their sin, there's consequence, and so God banishes them out of the Garden of Eden. But the details of Scripture are so, so important. What was the impetus of God sending Adam and Eve out? And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to look at this one detail. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now catch this very carefully. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat it and live forever, therefore, verse 23. Every time you see a therefore, it's there for a reason. Why is that therefore there? Therefore, with the possibility of this in mind, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man of the Garden of Eden. Why did God do this? He did this out of love. Lest they take of the tree and they eat of the fruit and they live in perpetual sin separated from God. You know what that's defined as? Hell. So God in love sends them out of the Garden of Eden for their good, ultimately to work out a larger story of repentance and restoration. God gives the law to the Israelites, right? As he gives the law to the Israelites, typically we think, the law, man, this is bad. The law is a bad thing. But notice what the law does. One, the law gives the people of Israel the standards by which they're supposed to live. Like, if we're to be the image of God and bear his likeness and bear his image, we need to know what it looks like to live and look like that and live by those standards. And so the law gives us those standards. The second thing flows out of the first, and what does that mean? It means that by living to the standard, the people of God look different from all of the other people around them. They are set apart. That's the definition of holiness. So now this people who look different, that resemble God, all of the other nations can look to them and they can see the goodness of God in these people. The scriptures are filled, absolutely filled with the love of God. And in Thessalonians, as Paul is writing to an infant church, he's talking about this type of love that is present within the ecclesia, the family of God. And so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 17. This is where we're going to start. Acts chapter 17. Now, here's what's happening in uh, the city of Thessalonica. First of all, what we need to know is that um, Thessalonica is the capital of Macedonia. That basically means that it's in a very, very important city. Um, It's a place where there's a significant amount of diversity 
all right? And so there are different people of different skin colors and social status and background, and they've all come together, and they do trade. Now, here's what typically happens when a bunch of different people come together. Sadly, when there is diversity, typically that results in distrust, disunity, and dysfunction. I'm going to say it one more time. Sadly, when there's diversity, it results in distrust, dysfunction, and disunity. You know, so I grew up in Chicago. Now you know the MJ comment, right? I grew up in Chicago, and I remember rolling around, riding my bike, listening for the dribble of a basketball. I love basketball. And so in the area where I grew up, I grew up where people were either, either primarily white, or primarily black, or primarily Latino. So here's what would happen. I would hear the basketball, and I would go, and I'd play, and if it was the summertime, and my skin all of a sudden started to get a little bit darker, right, and my hair was a little bit shorter, all of my black friends would be like, yo, you're one of us, come on, hang out, let's go. But then in the wintertime, <laughs> yeah, my skin starts to get a little bit lighter, and I'm like, I'm going to grow my hair a little bit. And all of a sudden, all the Latino boys and girls are like, yo, you're one of us, come with us. And here I am, confused. Like, where do I belong? And like, who is home? And what is family to me? Now, around this time, there was a popular TV show that, that hit the scene, right? And so when that TV show hit the scene, one day I was on the basketball court playing, and one of the kids looked over and go, hey, yo, Apu, come on over here. Now, notice what happened. Notice what happened. This is so interesting. All three services. Laughs on both sides of the black and the Latino. But when the Apu thing came up, it was this instant like, <gasps> like, do I laugh? Do I not? Is that funny or is that not funny? So here's what happened in my life. I was like, huh. Like, why do they call me Apu? And then I looked at the Simpsons, and fair warning, my mama hated the Simpsons. She thought Bart Simpson was Lucifer himself, all right? Like, it's that bad. In fact, she was so stressed out that she, if she even saw yellow people on a TV screen, it was going down. Like, she did not want any part of that. But here's the Simpsons TV show that becomes a cult fad, and all of a sudden, Apu is Indian or Pakistani. We don't know which one, but that is important, just so you know. And he's kind of this dim-witted knucklehead who owns a 7-Eleven. Right? And so now, all of a sudden, an entire people group have been defined by this one person called Apu. So everybody who's Indian owns a 7-Eleven? Right? Now, this is what was taking place in the city of Thessalonica. There were different people of different social classes and ethnicities. And this is what happens when distrust is present and dysfunction and disunity happens. You know what happens? People of the same type, they tend to stick together. So in a very diverse, multi-ethnic environment, what happened were these microcosms of single, homogeneous communities. And you know what ruled them? Ethnocentrism. That means that my ethnicity is superior to your ethnicity. And check this out. If my ethnicity is superior to your ethnicity, that means that I gotta figure out how your ethnicity is inferior to mine. That's what's taking place in the city of Thessalonica. People were separate. They didn't come together. And they were ruled by the evil powers of ethnocentrism. And then Paul, Timothy, and Silas come. And you know what they do? They begin to preach the gospel. This is what it says in Acts chapter 17. Now, when they had passed through the Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom. And on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And catch this, some of them, only some of the Jews from the synagogue, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Now watch this. As did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. That means a lot of the ladies followed too. But they weren't just any ladies, they were the leading women of the time. Do you see what took place? All of a sudden, as Paul preaches the gospel, the evil powers of ethnocentrism become crucified by the power of the gospel. 
And now all of a sudden, different people from different backgrounds are beginning to become knit together. And so our first point that we're going to see is that the, the church, the ecclesia, in Christ is a new family of diverse believers across all ethnic, social, political, and economic backgrounds. And we see this taking place in Acts. Now, years pass, this infant church begins to grow. What defines them is love. All of a sudden, as Paul goes back to write to them, he's heard of what they had done. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, go ahead and turn there. If you've got your iPhones, you can get there. If you've got your Androids, I'm sorry. Um, you'll get there at some point, maybe. Um, Verse 9 says this, for they themselves, what Paul is saying, all of these people who I'm talking to, for they, they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. And catch this, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The power of the gospel crucifies ethnocentric and he creates something new. It's the ecclesia, and this ecclesia is defined as a family of God. Throughout this letter to the Thessalonians, Paul, he actually mentions brothers and sisters over 13 times. This is unique. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the scriptures within Pauline letters. It happens significantly here. Why is that important? Well, as we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, this is what he begins to say. Now, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. I want to pause. What does it mean to have brotherly love? Some of us might think uh, to Philadelphia, right, the city of brotherly love. You're actually really close. The Greek word here is the Greek word Philadelphia. Now, for those of you that are Patriots fans, I'm sorry, right? I know it takes a little while for that one to go. Now listen, 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 listen. Philadelphia, brotherly love, has lost some of its significance. Why? This Greek word was used exclusively in the Greco-Roman time period to describe blood relationships between family members. Hold up. Wait a minute. Paul, what? Are you trying to tell me that the person who doesn't look like me, the person who's not from my same social status, the person who doesn't economically look like me and has a different political affiliation, you're saying that we are, are one blood? We're the same as if we had the blood of the same family? Do you see how Paul is flipping this entire thing upside down? So how is it possible for these different people with different backgrounds to become one family. And we see this in our next point over here. We see that the only way that this is possible is because the ecclesia is a family that is knit together by the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 4.10, John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, he describes Jesus being sent from heaven. Hold up. Do you remember what I talked about in the beginning? Talk about Adam and Eve. Right? They were sent out, but their sending was a means of love. Check this out. The first Adam, through him, all of humanity is enslaved. Jesus, in the second Adam, comes out of the perfection of heaven in the same way that the first Adam was sent out of the perfection of Eden into the chaos of the earth. Jesus, the second Adam, God sends him out of the perfection of heaven into the chaos of earth to right all of the things that were wronged in the past. When, when presence was broken, Jesus restores that broken presence. And how can it be restored? One way, through the way of the cross. Jesus, the divine son of God, he submits himself, he lays down his divinity, he subjects himself to the cross reserved for the worst of criminals. And on that cross, he sheds his blood. How is it possible for you and I who look so different to be one blood? There's only one way it's possible, and that is through the divine blood of Jesus that is shed on the cross on behalf of you and I. That's how we become one blood. Do 
You see that? The resurrection blood of Jesus is the only means by which you and I can be one blood. I, I didn't do this in the other services. I want to do it here. I want you to take a moment. I want you to look around this church. Look to the people to your right and to your left. Dr. Perkins was here last week and he said something that encouraged my heart. He talked about how he didn't uh, have to continue to literally bleed anymore because he saw what he was looking for in the context of this church. Do you see how powerful this image is? People of different ethnicities and backgrounds and cultures being drawn together, knit together by the power of the Holy Spirit? This is a sign of the resurrection power of Jesus himself. And so, if the Spirit of God dwells in the people of God, then how do we relate to each other? Well, Paul says it here in verse 9 again. He says, um, for you yourselves have been taught by God to what? Love one another. This is uh, actually in the Greek a reflexive pronoun, right? That simply means this, that it's relating to two ideas. The one idea is that in Christ, there's no longer social structure or classism. That stuff has been crucified at the cross, and if there are no longer any social structures and one person is not better than the other person, that means that we are an equal people in Christ. When, when Paul says that God himself taught you, this is the beautiful image of Jesus on bended knee washing the feet of the disciples. Now, heads up, y'all, I hate feet. No, I'm not playing with you. I literally, you can ask my wife. She's in the front row. Like, I hate feet. In fact, in the summertime, when everybody's wearing sandals, you ain't catching me with sandals. Uh Uh-uh. I'm going to wear socks with sandals if I have to, but nobody is seeing my feet. In fact, I don't even want you to look at my feet. In fact, I know, and I'm sweating right now, because I know that I'm talking about my feet. Y'all are thinking about my feet, so stop. (laughs) Stop it. But here's what's happening. This is not an image of like, oh, I'm going to kick off my uh, socks and uh, kick off my Jordans and I got some stank feet and Jesus is going to, you know. No, 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 that's not the image of what's taking place within uh, the first century church. You know what the image is here? The image is of dirt streets. Now, this dirt is made up of something. Do you want to know what this dirt is made up of? Mud. You know what this dirt is made up of and how it's made up of mud? Because it rains, it turns into this kind of mud stuff. You know what's in that mud? Fecal matter from both animals and humans and urine. We lose some of this stuff in translation. So we think of one thing about washing some people's nasty feet, but in the context of this, Jesus, the divine son of God, on bended knee, gets on his knees, and he washes people's literally nasty feet. Can you imagine the son of God on bended knee, washing the feet of the disciples and looking to them and telling them, it's true, I am the master, I am the teacher but I'm giving you an example what you should do to others. So to love one another is to love in the same means that Jesus loved us. And so the question is today, how do you love one another? Like for the teenagers in the room right now, like, you know, high school wasn't that far away from me, but I know it's filled with chaos. I know that there's always fighting going on and there's always bullying going on. How are you loving one another? Is the love of Christ coming out of you? Because guess what? The spirit of God is inside of you which equips you and empowers you to love like Christ loves. Look to the cross. Adults in the room, don't think that you're left out. What does it look like in your workplaces? What does it look like in your TC groups? We can start there. Is there dysfunction and disunity? Is there unresolved conflict that has separated you out? Because that stuff has been crucified at the cross. The power of the Holy Spirit knits us together, which means we need to tackle that head on. To love one another is to love the way that Jesus loved. 
Now, if we now know how to love one another, what is the implication of this love towards all of the outside people? Well, that's our next point. The ecclesia is God's chosen means of proclaiming the good news of the gospel to all people. Notice how this passage, verses 9 through 12, is bookended. Verse 12 says this, so that, why is that so that there? In light of this brotherly love, in light of loving one another, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and dependent on no one. Listen, this is not an excuse for you all to live incestually within your own Christian communities with people that you like. That's just reverting back to the evil that we got out of. You're being called to be missional witnesses in an outpost to point a broken and depraved humanity to the glories of God himself who is making his appeal in and through you. In 2 Corinthians 5, that's what Paul is talking about. That Christ is making his appeal in and through us so that all of humanity might be reconciled back to Christ. So do you see the power of the image of the family? As the church of God? It's with purpose and intentionality so we could love each other well, and in loving each other well, all of the people outside would be like, man, those Christians, they they actually love each other. That was what was happening here. Stories started being told. Man, those people that actually hated each other, man, they loved each other, and they're living out what they say they think. Well, that can make amazing impact in our lives. And it starts with one decision. Now, listen. It's actually kind of uncommon for maybe an Indian to be on a stage and to be teaching or preaching. Why? Because if you know anything about India, you'll know that India is primarily a Hindu, Buddhist, and even some Islamic uh, kind of religious background. And so as I thought about my own story, I thought about like, man, okay, like not only is it unique like that I have affections for God, but then also that I grew up in a Christian family. Like, how did those things work themselves out? And so I began to ask some questions of my grandfather. And my grandfather actually uh, told me something. He taught me something. We didn't learn about this in in, um, any of the history classes I took uh, in elementary school or high school. Did you know that the British took over India? Uh, Yeah? Good, because I didn't know that until recently. Like, I didn't, I didn't realize. So the British, uh, and it was called the British Raj. Everybody say Raj with me. Raj. Raj. That means rule or reign. You all just became bilingual. Good job. Okay? From 1858 to 1947, the people of India were subjugated underneath the thumbs of the oppressive British. That doesn't sound familiar, does it? Oh, Thessalonica? Oh, the Romans? Oh, they subjugated the Jews underneath there? Oh, wow, the same stuff is still happening underneath the sun? So what happened? Well, there was was massive ethnic tension. Indian people did not like white people. White people just viewed Indian people as a means to an end. You know what that means to an end was? To get all of their gold and bounce. That's what took place, literally. In 1947, they got all the gold that they wanted, and they were like, hey, you can have your country back. That never happens today. And so my grandfather, his grandfather, my great-grandfather, he was in the military. He was part of the royal family, and uh, he was probably a cavalryman. And so that meant that my grandfather had a little bit of status, right? And so all of a sudden, we're not quite sure what took place. Some of this is is steeped in myth, but when I talked to him, uh, he said that my great-grandfather, he was actually a a civil rights kind of activist, which is like, what, really? Wow, okay. And in India, there's these classes of people. This is not isolated just to our context, just so you know. The wickedness of ethnocentrism is is rampant everywhere else. And so there's a group of people called the untouchables that have no hope at all. And so these untouchables, they literally live with nothing. And so my great-grandfather, he wanted to give them the opportunity to live like human beings. And so people hated him, and somehow he died. So here's what took place. In Indian culture, as soon as a patriarch, a father, dies, that means that entire family, particularly those children, instantly become orphans. So my grandfather goes from kind of having some social status to becoming those kind of untouchable people and have nothing. Now, there's this sweet lady 
Her, gal, her name is uh, Helen Bailey. Helen Bailey is watching the travesty of what is taking place and says, hey, this isn't right. The gospel calls us to something different. And so I'm going to go to India. I'm going to start orphanages. I'm going to give an education. And in giving an education, I'm also going to share the gospel. So you know who her first student was? My grandfather. At seven years old, my and grandfather in Telugu is called Tata. Say that with me, Tata. Tata. All right, my Tata. Y'all are trilingual now. There you go. Tata at seven gets an education. He um, receives the gospel, the goodness of the gospel. God saves him. He goes back into that town and he shares the gospel with all of his family. They become saved. I want to introduce you to my Tata, y'all. This is Dr. K.M. John, and this is his beautiful wife, my grandmother, Tata and Amama. They end up having six children. Those six children end up, have, or end up getting married to six other people, and this is the next picture. Now, this is my mom and my dad. Now, notice this. This is crazy. I like, did not even think about some of this stuff. Do you see the multi-ethnicism that's going on right here? And so those 12 believers now, as a result of this one little lady, Helen Bailey, now they all have children. And so we've got here 17 grandchildren. And after 17 grandchildren come along the way, my wife and I, we help out a little bit, and we bring three great-grandchildren. Now it just dawned on me, we don't know where Levi is. (laughs) We still don't know where Levi is. (laughs) No, he's, he's, we'll find him. Now listen, <laughs> like, like, can you imagine that all of this is a result of one faithful lady? That is the power of the gospel. <clears throat> now, um, Tata is now getting older, you know, And as the oldest grandson, I have a responsibility. And my responsibility is to basically have any difficult conversations with Tata because I'm the first grandson and it's like a thing. So all of the family, they all have a huddle and they're like, okay, Joey, you're going to go to India and you're going to have a conversation with Tata. There's no reason for him to continue to be working so hard and doing ministry and doing vacation Bible schools for thousands of orphan children. Like, like he can retire, hand over the ministry to somebody else and come to the States and enjoy his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. Like, this is going to be great. So I'm like, really? I, okay, I guess I'll do it. I can do this. And I'm competitive. So I'm like, all right, I got this. So I go to India, and I invite my tata to come, and we have a great dinner, a Hyderabadi biryani. It's the most amazing thing you've ever had. We're eating it, and I begin to share about uh, my son Liam, his great-grandson. I'm like, tata, you got a great-grandson? And, and then about Levi who came along and, and two great-grandsons. And at that time, Britt was pregnant with Luke. So we've got three great-grandsons. And there are tears running down his eyes, big crocodile e- tears. And, and it was this beautiful moment. I'm like, all right, good. I'm about to go in for this kill right now. So I'm like, Tata, like, you don't need to keep working so hard. Just give up the ministry. Like, hand it off to the people. You've discipled hundreds of pastors. Just hand it off to them and come and live with us, and you can go and listen. My tata, his tears evaporated. (laughs) He looked at me straight in the face, and my tata speaks five languages, but just in case there's any translation issues, he uses English, because I only speak one, all right? And he goes, Joey Nana? That just means my beloved Joey, my dearest Joey. Only my tata and my wife are allowed to call me that, just so you know. Joy Nana, God showed his love to me. And if God showed his love to me, how could I not show his love to the least of these? I will die here. Don't talk to me again. <laughs> We've never talked about it again. It ain't no joke. Now, here's the deal. Don't think 
too much of Tata. In fact, if Tata found out that I elevated him to any status, he will grab a switch, he will put it in his TCA-approved bag, he will go across the Indian Ocean and spank me now. So please, don't think too much of him. You know what Tata would say? Think much of the gospel. Think much of Jesus. Think much of that. This is the power of the gospel. Now, uh, we go to our soul tattoo. Get connected to the family life of Transformation Church through TC Home Groups. Please, I cannot beg you enough, do not be deceived into thinking that just because you came here on a weekend that you can get all of the beauty that is found within the family of God. If you've been at TC for a while, you know we say this often, help me. We say this is just the? Again, this is just the? This is just the huddle. How does this family flesh itself out? Pastor Derwin and Vicky and the executive leadership team here at TC have been so intentional to provide TC home groups because it's within the context of this home groups that you can be known and allow yourself to know other people. It is a beautiful image of God. I can tell you this, when my youngest son, Luke, had a seizure, a febrile seizure, it's induced by uh, a high fever. It was my TC home group that rallied around us and provided meals. When there are health problems that are taking place uh, inside of our TC home group, we rally together and we say, hey, if we're really the family of God, like if we really believe this stuff, we gotta flesh it out, we gotta act it out, and it has brought us together. A group of us guys, uh, I think about James and Brent, um, and I think about Mario, we get together every now and then, and, and, and we have breakfast on Fridays. I mean, this is the beauty of what takes place when you are known, and guess what? They don't think too much about me. They just know me as Joel, as a husband, as a dad. We've got kids. I think about Mark Dave, who, who who's kind of, you know, had kids, and they go out, and he gives me hope for a future. <laughs> That's the beauty of the church, y'all. Now, it is not lost on me that some of you are here and you're listening to this concept of a family and we're talking about fathers and mothers and we're talking about how this beautiful relationship is. It's not lost on me that there might be a narrative that's going on in your head right now saying, well, Joel, you don't know about my family. You don't know about my dad. You don't know about the foster system that I went through to struggle and survive, and you want me to buy into this idea of a family? It's not lost on me. I get that. But let me tell you this. The same divine blood of Jesus that takes different people who were once enemies and turns them into friends, that same divine resurrection blood of Jesus has the power to reinform your story and to see you how broken things can be put together masterfully by the master creator himself. Um, And there's some of you who are desperate tonight saying, tonight, I speak at conferences at night usually, it's morning, I know that, sorry. Some of you are desperate this morning and you're thinking, gosh, I would love to have a family like that. Like, that would be a nice thing to have. But you've kind of been holding the Lord kind of out far back for a while. I want to invite you to be a part of this family. I want to invite you to take part in the beauty that is found in the multi-ethnic, diverse, multi-generational family of God. Because it is transformative in our lives and it prepares us for a future where God is going to come back and restore all things finally and make them new. So if you want to be part of this new family, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a second, but would you all pray with me? God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that in love you have been working throughout the course of human history to reconcile all the things that went wrong. We thank you that in love you sent your son Jesus. And when we're confused and when we don't know what's happening in our families or in our marriages or with our children, that we can look to the cross. 
that when we're confused and we're not quite sure what's taking place, we can find our hope and our strength in the finished work of what Jesus has done and how the Holy Spirit now knits us together to empower us to walk out this life. And so if you want to be part of the family, would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, I confess of my sin. Lord, I confess of my selfish ambition. God, I recognize that you conquered sin and death and rose again victorious, and I want some of that. And so I submit myself to the kingship of Jesus to be part of this covenant community of faith, the family of God. I step into that. I want that. I claim that. God, we love you and we thank you that you loved us first. In your name we pray, amen. Y'all give a hand to anybody who prayed that prayer.